Please take your seats. The World Around Summit will begin shortly. The theater. Can you hear me now? Okay. I am Syra Levinson, Deputy Director and Gail Engelberg Director of Education and Public Engagement here at the Guggenheim. And we welcome our audiences, both those who are listening in person here in the theater and those who are with us online. Thank you so much for being with us today. The Guggenheim Museum was founded with the idea that works of art can shift thinking patterns, create new imaginaries, even shift our consciousness. Our founders created a building that replicates the spiral form we see so often in nature. It's a circular experience. It's a journey that you share with others who are in the space. In other words, this is a space to create and explore visionary forms. What are today's visionary forms? You will hear about so many of them in today's program. They move beyond extraction and exploitation of people and resources. Today's visionary forms ask us to think from the land, to use our human instrument and all its sensorial capacities, to use technology not as an escape from but as a return to real life and to connecting with each other, with place and with the past and the future. I want to repeat something that I said at our convening that we hosted with the world around in October, which was focused on the theme of land. To notice is a privilege and a responsibility. To not notice is a sign of privilege. I recognize that we stand on Mauna Hata, traditional territory of the Lenape Nation. I also recognize that our gathering today in the digital space requires resources from the land that come at a cost to our planet and that we must consider this carefully as our investment in technology grows. Today's program is presented with our partner, the world around, and is part of a residency that focuses on social, environmental, and spatial justice as articulated in the work of architects, artists, and designers. To quote Beatrice, who you'll meet in a minute if you don't already know her, this is a first draft of architectural history, an archive and a resource for actionable change. I'd like to acknowledge the work of the many people who've made it possible for this program to be presented to you today. My colleagues who run our theater, our film crew, our visitor services, operations, and security teams who make it possible for us all to be here today safely together. I'd like to thank my curatorial colleagues, development colleagues, and our communications teams. I'd also like to express deep gratitude to Jennifer Yi, Alan Seiss, and Laili Amigi, who you met when you were coming in the door, our public programs team that made today's event possible. I'd like to thank our trustees and the leadership team of the institution who support our mission. 
And I'd like to introduce you to our partner, Beatrice Galilee, who is executive director and co-founder of The World Around. Thanks to her and executive producer, Satomi Blair, we have an incredible program for you today. I'd also like to thank our new partners at Neva Institute. Did I say that right? I hope so. Um, uh, who have been incredible partners, and you should stay tuned for an event that they're hosting in June. And last but not least, my profound gratitude goes to our speakers for their courageous and visionary work. A couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, if you're here with us in person, the exit door is the one you entered through. Uh, there are restrooms to the right, my right, um, through the glass doors. And please uh, kindly keep your masks on while you're in the audience today. And um, please no flash photography and video recording, although we will be streaming and uh, archiving today's events. You can see it later. For those who are tuning in virtually, thank you so much. We're so pleased to have you. And we welcome your comments via the chat feature on YouTube. There will be short breaks between the sessions, and you can find a schedule for today's event in the program page. With that, I will pass it to Beatrice, emerging shortly, to tell you more about today's event. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to keep it fast because we're here to hear from other people, not just us. Um, but um, welcome. Thank you. Welcome back to the world around. Um, we're, uh, we're so grateful to be here at the Guggenheim Museum, one of the most beautiful auditoriums in New York. And thanks to our partners, um, the New Institute, who are here too. Um, I know many of you have been following the world around since our launch, and um, thank you so much for, your, for following us through. And for those of you who are new uh, to our community, welcome. Um, we are a new institution. We're a, a platform for contemporary architecture and design. And one of the reasons that we do this is that we believe that architecture is current affairs. Architecture is one of the most important, um, you know, amongst the most important ways of calibrating and understanding our world. And today we're presenting some of the people, um, some of the most interesting progressive ideas. Um, it's a touch point for us to, to take a moment in time and reflect on um, the creatives, the culture um, around contemporary architecture and design um, and learn from it and hopefully be um, inspired by it too. I'd like to thank our board of directors of The World Around, led by Diego Marroquin. Um, we're proud to have uh, be a, a 501c3 nonprofit, um, and our board includes Elizabeth Diller, Vishan Chakrabarti, Harriet Harris, Tina Vaz, Adam Flato, Reynold Levy, and our uh, founder and board chair, Diego Marroquin. Um, I'd also like to thank our board of advisors, led by Pete Dillon, our global partners, Meta Open Arts, and Amura Lab, and the generosity of the individual donors that make our program possible. Um, our incredible design uh, by 2 by 4 as always, led by Susan Sellers and our production team for Hawk and Satomi Blair. Um, if you haven't seen anything by the world around, we have a whole archive of videos on our website, so please um, check back there. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce this first session, and I'm so um, proud and excited to have gathered um, this group of really visionary people together today. Um, we're talking in this session about, well, the title of the session is School Sneakers and Stories as Agents of Change. Um, and what that means is that these are people who have been making things, making designs, making schools, making objects, and through those objects, we start to understand the agency of design, and we start to understand the power of design to change communities, um, to move ideas forward, um, and essentially to make the environment and the ecology that we live in a better place. Um, and one of the people that's kicking off today, I'm such a big fan of, and I know many of you are too, um, it's Leslie Loco, who is the founder of the African Futures Institute um, in Accra, Ghana. Um, she's going to be talking about that work and other things, and I'm going to leave it over to her. And um, thank you so much for being with us today. I really hope you enjoy it. Um, we're very proud of what we've achieved and very proud of our team. Um, please, for those of you watching online, uh, share your thoughts with us and your reflections and yeah, we'll see you in June um, for the, the next edition of The World Around later as well. So without further ado, Leslie Lurko, thank you so much, everybody. I'll see you later.
So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and a very big thank you to Beatrice and her team for the kind invitation to come to New York. I left a very different city in July 2020, so it's great to see New York rebounding. I'm going to talk about the African Futures Institute, the AFI, which was launched in Accra, Ghana, six months ago. But before I say anything about it, I want to first acknowledge four people without whose support the AFI or I wouldn't be standing here or anywhere for that matter. Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation, Elizabeth Ad Alexander of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Sir David Ajay and Hanif Kara. I owe more than I can put into words to their trust and faith. Their support is also a really powerful reminder of the emotional bonds of history which anchor us all. So my favorite expression over the past six months has been, the next time I say I'm going to open a school of architecture, please shoot me. I promise you it is only said half in jest. The AFI is an institution that is still very much in the making, very much in progress, without any real template or precedent. It owes much to multiple small and often independent schools of architecture that have emerged over the past 50 years around the world. It also owes a lot to the Radical Pedagogies project begun by Beatrice Colomina at Princeton University, not so much in terms of its structure or curriculum or even its ambitions, but more in the idea of radix, an experimental rhizome of ideas and perspectives brought together in a single place, the institute or the program, and in our case, through our network of talks, courses, and research. The title of this afternoon's talk, I Prefer the Word, is taken from the film Derrida, a documentary that was made in 2002 by Kirby Dick and Amy Zeering Kaufman. And I'm going to play a very short excerpt. En général, j'essaie de distinguer entre le futur et l'avenir. Le futur, c'est ce qui demain ce que prochain deviendra ce qui est deviendra donc il y a le futur des programmes le futur prévisible predictable programs prescriptions tout ce qui en quelque sorte peut être schedule donc prévu et l'avenir je préfère le mot avenir to come parce que ça se réfère à quelqu'un qui vient à ce qui vient et qui, venant, arrivant, n'est pas prévisible. Et pour moi, c'est ça, le, le vrai futur, c'est qui est unpredictable. L'autre qui vient sans que je puisse même l'attendre, d'une certaine manière, sans que je puisse m'y attendre. Donc s'il y a du vrai futur au-delà du futur, c'est l'avenir en tant que... Il est la venue de l'autre là où je ne veux pas le prévoir. Two things strike me as particularly meaningful in this short clip. One, the sense of there being two types of future, not one. And two, the idea that the second, more provocative future, l'avenir, is heralded by the other the one who comes without my being able to anticipate their arrival, someone you do not or cannot know, someone who is always other. I think it's fair to say that Africa's experience of the future was Derridean, in the sense that for us, the arrival of the other several hundred years ago brought with it a future that was so completely unexpected, unplanned and unpredictable that we are still negotiating what it means the future was always already our now, near, and next. This is um, one of the silos that was built by Kwame Nkrumah. This is a building from the 60s, which is lost in time. And then we are trying to excavate it in order to be able to produce new futures. We 
we're trying to open up the discourse in terms of art. How do we go back to like this, the idea of the ground zero, the bottom line, in order to be able to find new forms of inspiration that somehow includes everyone? The AFI's big design project, and this is becoming clearer to me every day, isn't so much the design of a space, a building, a program, or even a school. It's much broader than that, and therefore harder to describe. I don't mean to suggest that it's any bigger or better, just broader. And the difficulty in describing it comes down to the difference between two words, exploration and explanation. When I first began teaching in the United States in the late 1990s, it was the first time I'd ever heard the words design problem, at least in connection with architecture. I'd never thought of a brief or a project as a problem, even though there are clearly challenges embedded within every design situation. But the word problem really threw me. And I would like to play an extract from a longer piece of work done by a South African former student, Gugu Tembu, who was a student in Unit 12, the graduate teaching laboratory that Samaya Valley and I ran for several years. And in fact, Samaya was a, a guest here last year at The World Around. And the work that you're about to see was supervised by her in Gugu's last year, and it bears Samaya's unmistakable hand. Across from me at the kitchen table, my mother smiles over tea that she drinks out of a measuring glass. She says she doesn't deprive herself but I've learned to find nuance in every movement of her fork, in every crinkle of her brow, as she offers me the uneaten pieces on her plate. I've realized that she only eats dinner when I suggest it. I wonder what she does when I'm not there to do so. Maybe this is why my house feels bigger each time I return. It's proportional. As she shrinks, the space around her seems increasingly vast. She wanes while my father waxes. His stomach has grown round with late nights, oysters, and privilege. It was the same with his parents. As my grandmother became frail and angular, her husband swelled to red round cheeks and a round stomach. And I wonder if my lineage is one of women shrinking. Making space for the entrance of men into their lives. Not knowing how to fill it back up once they leave. I have been taught accommodation. My brother never thinks before he speaks. I have been taught to filter. How can anyone have a relationship to food, he asks, laughing as I eat the black bean soup I chose for its lack of carbs. I want to say, we come from difference. You have been taught to grow out. I have been taught to grow in. You learn from our father how to emit, how to produce, to roll each thought off your tongue with confidence. You used to lose your voice every other week from shouting so much. I learn to absorb. I took lessons from our mother in creating space around myself. I learned to read the knots in her forehead, and I never meant to replicate her, but spend enough time sitting across from someone and you pick up their habits. That's why women in my family have been shrinking for decades. We all learned from each other the way each generation taught the next how to knit, weaving silence in between the threads, deciding how many bites is too many, how much space she deserves to occupy. Watching the struggle, I either mimic or hate her, and I don't want to do either anymore. But the burden of this house has followed me across the country. I asked five questions today, and all of them started with the word sorry. Inheritance is accidental. How might one describe the design pro problem here? The Zulu word for an architect, Umkambi Wesino, is a beautifully rich and complex phrase, meaning an alchemist or a magician of space, the maker of a sensation, 
or the maker of a situation. In Google's work, there are clearly multiple narratives, forms, materials, and uses at play. Is the problem one of finding voice, finding the right space or form for that voice, finding the right materials to give life to a situation, finding the right platform or program? Is she, a young Zulu female architect, the problem? Or is the curriculum the problem? You may be surprised to understand that Gugu's piece is neither the result of a studio nor a seminar, which is how most schools of architecture distinguish between design and history and theory. One is taught in studio and the other in a seminar or a lecture space. She was able to design her own path through graduate architectural education in a uniquely expansive way. It's not about architecture, it's about urbanism. And it's about what we do with our cities, it's about how we deploy them, it's about scale, it's about governance, it's about sustainability. And uh, we have to totally rethink the whole process. Uh, uh, I recently realized that uh, I'm not the future anymore. This is why I thought that uh, the young, uh, younger generation's approach uh, to urbanism was quite interesting. The Kofia Diabati are the epitome of the phrase, speak softly and carry a big stick. <laughs> One of the most significant results of the two large-scale protests in South Africa between 2015 and 2017 was the angry territory that was opened in their aftermath, which allowed those with curiosity and appetite for genuine change to experiment in a way that would have been unthinkable even five years earlier. An American motivational speaker is an unlikely person to quote, but I first read this almost 30 years ago, and it has remained one of the most important lessons I've learned as an educator. The imagination is the most powerful and fertile tool of liberation we possess. Like Issa, I realize I am no longer the future, particularly in the world's youngest continent. But as the founder of an educational institute, I do have a role and a certain responsibility in suggesting what shape the future may take. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to walk off now. I'm Andrea. No, let's <laughs> read again. Shall we say hi or we just say I'm Andrea Trimarchi and yeah. everyone? Okay. So what was it again? Interview second. I'm Andrea Trimarchi. I'm Simone Farrazin. And uh, together we are a studio from a Fantasma, a design studio based in Milan and Rotterdam. Was it only this part or the whole thing? Only this. Okay, great. So we have it. <laughs> Our practice is divided essentially into big chunk. One is more, I would say, traditional and rooted in uh, actually industrial design. And another one is much more uh, research-based. And of course, the cohabitation of these two nature is extremely complex. We started working in 2009, and we established our practice uh, essentially with uh, extensive material explorations and most recently said we shifted to more, I would say, contextual and uh, strategic analysis of the design industry, specifically regarding electronic waste and the timber industry. Every product that we use daily is in fact a product of a geodesign, we would say, but it's, uh, we believe that for the ecological development of the discipline, it is extremely important to not only work on a material level, but actually rethink the way we uh, observe, understand this infrastructure we often give it for granted. And one of the most important concern of geodesign, of course, is the ecological uh, crisis we are living in. It's also inviting as much as possible also people from other disciplines to join. And there is a lot of collective thinking. 
the reason why we decided to focus on the timber industry, actually there are several different reasons. Uh, one is personal, and it's because whenever we do these um, endeavors, we hopefully uh, want that the research doesn't remain a uh, museum work, but also could inform our more commercial practice. Another reason uh, was contextual. We have always been obsessed with the great exhibition of the 51. What we were specifically interested in is that for the first time in architecture, that is conceived for the survival of living creatures, plants and trees, was actually applied for actually the display of industrial development. And those trees uh, were relegated to form of the core within the fair. And in a way for us, the exhibition, the focus on the timber industry, is a way to uh, take back those relegated decorative plants and give them center stage in the, in the show. So we focus on timber. Uh, because of all these reasons. And the exhibition became really a collective show to somehow not talk about wood, which would have been much more traditional for design, but actually the industry of wood extraction from forests. Because we, are, we believe that via the understanding of, this, of the politics that regulate this industry, we as designers can make m much more informed choices when we also interact with the clients we work daily. It was inevitable to look into the relationships between the development in the industry during colonial time and how this influence uh, still nowadays um, the extractions of timber. Specifically, the core of the exhibition is a selection of objects, uh, actually of material samples, again uh, selected from the great exhibition of the 51 uh, that are now uh, part of the Kew Garden uh, Silarium collection, which was founded immediately after the Great Exhibition. And the collection was called the Economic Botany Collection. Many of the samples of wood collected there are uh, from the British Empire, collected from, uh, of course, all over the world. And interestingly, the, the name itself, the Economic Botany Collection, says it all. In fact, it was a gigantic material sample where designers, architects, and whoever was interested could um, come there to uh, study these uh, new typologies of timber, which were, of course, uh, not known in Europe. And many of the samples were also accompanied with indigenous um, tools stolen from the original countries to display how this wood could also be applied. Interestingly enough, uh, nowadays these uh, uh, collections, fortunately, are reconceptualized as tools for scientific development, but also to um, fight illegal logging. But of course, the countries that owns extensive material libraries to conduct these tests are countries that has an, a colonial past and it owns extensive library of materials. So of course, there is these questions of also how legality is defined. When we talk about uh, illegal logging, actually we should first explain the, the definition of illegal logging. Um, basically, uh, what the European Union is doing at this moment is importing wood, of course, from all over the world, and is asking the countries that is exporting the material to define um, what is illegal for that specific country. We must admit the European Union is doing you know, an intense work in trying to have a post-colonial attitude in the way the idea of legality is constructed. Nevertheless, of course, this is just an example of how, let's say, the power still remains in the hands of uh, the, the countries that exploited many of um, other than European countries. Of course, this does not mean that the exporting country is uh, promoting sustainable ways of logging but at least it is confronted with, with a question of defining what is legal or, or not. The reality is that no matter this is in place only since 2012, still the 30% of wood entering European Union in the form of objects or in the form of material samples is still uh, of illegally, uh, illegally sourced. And we had a section in the exhibition actually uh, addressing this. We collected um, several objects throughout the years of the exhibition, 
and uh, random objects uh, from charcoal for barbecue, uh, spatulas, tools for working, wood, and so on. And one of the most shocking ones probably was the barbecue. Uh, the charcoal for barbecue. The charcoal, the charcoal. I mean, the charcoal for barbecue, there is like very, very rare uh, wood inside. Tropical timbers, that because they're incinerated, they're not recognizable. So um, many tropical species were used in there. Also because one of the uh, issues uh, related to, to timber, of course, are certification. I mean, thanks God we have certification. But certification are also sometimes tricky uh, because especially the most common one are in any case coming uh, from um, privates. Uh, so mm, it's very difficult then to really trust those certification. In a way, um, I think the future of the timber industry will be certification that comes much more from uh, governative uh, um, entities. entities. One of the subjects we explore with the exhibition, and that's also one of the reasons why we started thinking about the timber industry, is that we were interested in exploring the complex ethical questions of working with living, with living beings. And of course, when we talk about forests, uh, it's not um, you know, it's something we are all aware since you know a long time that the, you know trees are living living creatures, and there has been several um, ways of looking also into the idea of granting rights, for instance, to to, to nature, to trees uh, specifically, which is of course a challenging concept but an extremely valuable one. Of course, it opened up questions regarding um, how can we as designers think about not only the needs of humans, which has been the focus for basically uh, since the idea of design has been invented, and thinking about uh, ecology as the cohabitation of different creatures on planet Earth. What I think it's amazing about the design is that really sits in between you know, the extraction of material and transformation into goods and the actually desirable goods. So of course we do have the power to really change that structure and of course it's also a discipline that should recuperate a much more philosophical thinking. If I think about you know, the 60s and the 70s, uh, architect and designer were much more involved into uh, theorizing the discipline. I think in the last 20 years we, we've lost that, that part. But in front of us we have a completely different generation of people. They are absolutely much more radical than us and they, are, they don't want to get in, in any way possible into compromises. That sometimes can be also problematic. Um, but I think that's, uh, the, the, that's how we see the, the future of the discipline. There should be an hybrid within, uh, between like a much more research approach and uh, a um, commercial one. What we see in our students' geodesign is that they're definitely preoccupied with the reality of the world we live in. And they do not see design as a way of delivering products, but more design as the opportunity of questioning the way we deliver those products. Um, I think we're still at the stage where the critique is still the main focus, uh, but of course in a very short time we will also start to see uh, the development of solutions and form of design activism also. So the preoccupation is becoming much more holistic and I think that's uh, inevitable, I think. It is extremely difficult to reconcile the research side and the more, I would say, radical side of our practice with a commercial one. On the other side, we really love the fact that we, sometimes we are extremely confronted with ethical questions when we work with our clients, and very often we take compromises. The ecological impact of what we're doing is absolutely not what we wanted, but it's much better than where we started. Having these compromises, having this conversation, is also what put us in a position to understand the mechanism of the, the discipline we are involved in. So we would never abandon this complex debate and we have internal debate. But this is something that we are trying to, to do with our practice. And I think it's very important that we can do it because we are immersed within our practice. We are not theoricians, we are really practitioners. My name is Ursula Biemann. I'm an artist and videomaker based in Zurich, Switzerland. 
For the last 10 years or so, my focus has been on environmental concerns and our relationship to the Earth. I do field work in remote places from the Arctic region to the Amazonian forest. On many of these field trips, I had encounters with indigenous communities and their way of thinking about this vital relationship. I'll be talking here about my most recent projects in Colombia. My involvement started a few years ago with an invitation from a curator in Bogota to go on a field trip to the Andean Amazon. That's an extremely biodiverse region. The south of Colombia had been closed off for several decades and had just opened up with the signing of the peace agreement. So for a whole month, the leader of the indigenous Inga people took me through the region in his bulletproof car. At the end of the trip, he asked me if I could help him set up a university in his territories. So that's how I got drawn into the amazing project of co-creating indigenous an indigenous biocultural university with the Inga people. I saw this as a great chance to learn more about indigenous knowledge systems. Art and video making are important in this project as a way of creating a visual and intellectual memory of this unique process of becoming university. But also by generating video archives uh, on their knowledge and history and for communicating uh, the project uh, with the world and within the community as well. So um, I call this part of the project Devenir Universidad, Becoming University. And what is becoming university is not so much the Inga people, but the territory itself, the living, sentient, cognitive territory, because all knowledge comes from here, as, I, as they taught me. Knowledge can only be produced in the encounter with the land and all the beings who inhabit it. It occurs while walking through the land. And when their territory gets destroyed in the Amazon, they don't just lose land, they also lose their ability to think and to know. And that's why the university is not going to be a centralized campus, but a network of sites and paths spreading across the entire vast territory where knowledge can be practiced in the form of river learning, um, cloud learning, uh, forest learning, chagra learning, and so on. My new video, Forest Mind, emerges from this long-term collaboration with the Inga people on the indigenous university. Forest Mind is about the intelligence of nature and the intelligence in nature viewed from both a scientific and a shamanic perspective. From Western science, we know a lot more now about the ability of plants to sense, communicate and take decisions, sometimes as complex as within the brain. So there is a growing respect for plants. But for indigenous people in the Amazon, this intelligence goes much further. It's a vital force that permeates all that exists, both visible and invisible entities, endowing them with awareness and meaning. Shamans in the Amazon practice the science of ayahuasca that allows them to engage with this life energy. They have always insisted on the interconnection of all life. With the discovery of DNA in the 1950s, this has also been confirmed by Western science because we are all made of the same DNA, trees, plants, insects, mammals, including humans. We are all interconnected in this deep structural way. So that's one statement I want to make with Forest Mind. In my research, I came across another interesting fact that these DNA molecules emit light waves, so-called biophotons. It's in the ultra-weak light range, but with the new instruments, they are now measurable. The Amazonian medics have developed a technique that allows them to interact with this luminous, energetic part of DNA. They sometimes call them spirits. 
And what they call spirits is closer to microbiology than to religion. I think that for the longest time, indigenous science has been interpreted through the filter of the early missionaries who applied their own Christian concepts to what they observed. I was curious what science is doing in Colombia. Biotech companies have started with DNA sequencing the entire rainforest, breaking it down to the smallest fragments to be used as a resource for the industries. They are very present in Colombia. I wanted to know where modern science is going with this. So for the second part of uh, Forest Mind, I started a collaboration with ETH, the Institute for Science and Technology here in Zurich. They had made a recent technological breakthrough in new ways of using DNA knowledge. So far, information, as we know, is stored in the binary code of 0, 1, but this new technology converts digital code into DNA code and molecules and then encapsulates them in a microscopic glass beads. In this form, they are unperishable. They can be stored for eternity. And because it's written in humanity's own code, we will always remember it. This research is relevant to me as a digital artist as well, and that's exciting. Uh, so we made an experiment at the ETH lab. We took a sound recording a video image and a tiny piece of real, a real seed of a, of a tree from the endangered rainforest in Colombia and converted everything into one single DNA code. The problem was that the outcome, these microscopic glass beads, don't really make for an impressive presentation in the art space. So I asked if the process of DNA sequencing actually generates images that I could perhaps use in the video. So the images you see are from the 160 cross sections of the double helix. It's kind of similar to having a CT scan of each of the spinal vertebrae. Lining them up on the, on the timeline, uh, it produces some kind of flimmering animation it's a bit like a flip book journey through the double helix. That's how these different strands of thinking, the indigenous and the scientific, come together in this project. Please welcome to the stage Camilla Marambio. Hello. I'm jittery with excitement at being here. I grew up not too far away from this museum, and though at age 16 I returned to my parents' homeland, Chile, I still consider this neighborhood my crib. So it's very special for me to be here to talk to you about something that is of utmost importance, not just for Chile, but for the world. The archipelago of Tierra del Fuego and the peatlands of the southernmost tip of Patagonia are the protagonists of the stories I'm going to tell you today. Stories that are not my own, but that 
I'm here to represent and give a voice to. Now, when I was putting this presentation together a couple of days ago, I knew that the message was charged with very much power, urgency, but just a few days ago, after I'd already sent through my presentation, a fire broke out in Tierra del Fuego, and its peatlands have begun to burn. So overwhelmed with urgency, I've decided to begin this presentation by acknowledging that I'm not here alone. And the words that are looming behind me, hol, hol, tol, hol, hol, tol, are Shelknam language. The Shelknam ancestors are accompanying me as much as a kin group that I'm part of, a complex social architecture of people, places, animals, and technologies that work to conserve the peatlands. I want to bring them into this room and also for the listeners who are not here so that you get a sense of this rich, biodiverse social architecture. I'm going to ask us to attend to these voices by closing our eyes. And now we're going to talk about when the weather turns nice, which was celebrated, obviously, with a bonfire. And we have a bonfire here. And we're going to dance. So everybody who wants to join the game, come this way. I didn't understand. OK, OK, now the song. No, no. The song. At the end, at the end. So we're going to end up all entangled? Yes, we're all going to get entangled. Any which way, the, the only thing is that when it's done, the two guys start to spiral around each other. It was dance when the whale calves arrived in the spring at the end of the winter. So the song is a welcome to the whales. Whales in Shelknam is Hoshin. When I say peatlands, what do you imagine? Because when I say forest, river, desert, coastline, I assume that you immediately picture one of these ecosystems, or you smell them, or a memory comes up for you. Peatlands were formed thousands of years ago. When the glaciers retreated, they left indentations in the land. These pools started to gather water, both from the melting ice, but also from rain. And eventually, debris began to accumulate. Plant matter, the bodies of animals that tumbled into these wetlands. Layer upon layer of this organic matter, the acidity levels of these pools changed, creating a sort of pickled ecosystem whereby nothing became fully decomposed. This state of 
being alive but not quite alive is what makes peatlands so rich in carbon. Peatlands cover about 3% of the world's land mass, yet they are the carbon sinks of this planet. They store over 500 gigatons of carbon in this anaerobic ecosystem that was populated by sphagnum, the only moss that could handle this acidity. These peatlands that you see behind me are the peatlands of Tierra del Fuego, Caruquinca. This is a place that I am fully dedicated to. It's been over 12 years that I founded Ensayos, a collective transdisciplinary research practice that is dedicated to the well-being of Tierra del Fuego, be it either by looking at invasive species, general educational um, misunderstandings around its ecosystems, or other threats uh, like now the fires that are burning these peatlands. Ensayos and Tierra del Fuego are intimately bound up with an area that you see in the map in the dark green, which is the Wildlife Conservation Society's natural reserve called Karukinka. Karukinka. In Shagnam, Karukinka means our land. This land, which is over 300,000 hectares on the Chilean side of Tierra del Fuego, are 70,000 hectares of peatlands. The Shagnam people who lived with and on these peatlands often describe peatlands as ancestors. During a time when the world was but elemental forces that were roaming the earth, meeting each other in a lust and desirous encounters, water, air, wind, um, finally began to settle down, created mountains, created coastlines, and when they reached the southernmost tip of this continent called the Americas or Abiyayala, they, just, they laid to rest and became bodies of wet, mushy, spongy peat, rich in carbon, the substance that makes us all. The Shalkam have suffered greatly due to colonization. Their language has been considered an extinct language. But today, you heard some of the voices of Shalkam people. Himani Molina was leading us in dance and song in the rumor that I played for you earlier. Here we are, just weeks ago, learning with and from the peat lands of Tierra del Fuego attempting to figure out how to translate its wants, its calls, its needs, its desire to be conserved. Translation is a very tricky thing when you're talking about human, non-human communication. This is why we take the lead from Himani and some of her ancestral understandings of how this can be done through song. In translation, we also use technologies, instruments, like the ones that appear in this photograph. We use a practice called chayar, which is that you take your instruments and you bless them, but you also ask them to be extensions of your heart, for them to work alongside with you in the intention of translation. Translation from the southernmost tip of South America to the north poses many, many risks and dangers, ones that I know very well. I'm here embodying them in many ways. In our long history um, of colonization, Shetnam people, their artifacts, and their language have been taken from them, displaced, and been misinterpreted, and even claimed extinct. Therefore, it's always a risk to engage in translation. But we're attempting to do this otherwise by generating complicities amongst bodies, shaknam and non shaknam like you see in this picture, giving each other the room to embody one another in a search for a more just way of communicating the peatlands' urgent need to be conserved. We're creating a device, an, 
aesthetics of custodial ecological action that will take shape at um, the upcoming Venice Biennale in what we call an airship. This airship is a mechanism for conservation where language, song, peatlands, and science all convene to create a sensorium that generates a responsibility because you hear the bog. What you heard earlier was a rumor from Hon Hon Turvaton. Hon Hon. Repetition is very important in Shelknam language as it is in most indigenous languages. It is there to insist on value and continuity. And this is what we are doing. This is what I am doing here with you. So take these words and repeat them. Put them in your mouth, move them around your bodies. And if you are so provoked, become part of Chol Chol Tol, because the peatlands that we were going to claim to the world needed to be conserved will now need to be restored due to the fires. This is a very different story than I had thought I would come here to tell you. And voicing these words, I think of the presentation that we just heard, Ursula, describing how the land is this archive of knowledge. Um, and this last slide that I had was also to embody that. Knowledge is within these peat bogs as archives of paleoecological information and culture. Ta da! <laughs> it's important. It's important that we come together. Chol, um, chol, tol.
Hello, it's a pleasure and an honor to be sharing this virtual space together, Amitav. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Lucia. I'm a curator uh, working at the intersection of art and ecology. Uh, over the course of my um, profession, I've really been concerned with the role that culture can play towards uh, environmental justice and environmental balance. How can it join that those efforts? Um, I am beyond uh, overjoyed and not a little intimidated to be here in conversation with you, Amitav Ghosh, the author of so many works of fiction, including The Hungry Tide or Sea of Poppies, the first and the Ibis trilogy, of course, uh, as well as so much uh, sort of paradigm shifting nonfiction, including The Great Derangement, a book that I found so inspiring, as well as terrifying, so in, um, uh, so crucial as a wake-up call to culture makers of today not to ignore the climate crisis. So again, welcome and thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, Amitav, you've spoken before of the role that the Sundarbans have played in the development of your ecological consciousness. And I wanted to begin by asking you about this. Um, about uh, this experience and how, um, how and in what way it began to make its way through to your fiction work, climate, ecology, the environment? Well, <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm from Bengal. Bengal is one of the, uh, as everybody knows, it's uh, one of the most threatened uh, parts of the world. Uh, sea level rise and the intensification of hurricanes has become a major danger for Bengal. Uh, but my sort of awareness of these issues really began around uh, the year 2000 when I started uh, doing the research for the Hungry Tide. I spent quite a lot of time in the Sundarbans at that point. And it was already clear then that the Sundarbans were being very badly affected uh, by sea level rise and by, uh, you know, intensification of storms, uh, saltwater intrusion and so on. Uh, people were losing their lands. Uh, islands were going underwater. And those processes have really accelerated over the last few years. Uh, most of all, the impacts of cyclones have made uh, life unlivable there for, for many, many people. And, uh, you know, we're not just talking about a few people, we're talking about millions of people who live in this region. Um. So you began the great arrangement with a consideration of the kind of uncanny nature of nature when it suddenly appears to come alive in these events such as cyclones or earthquakes. Um, but in The Nutmeg's Curse, which is your most recent nonfiction, you start with something much smaller and on the surface much more humble, a nutmeg, although you do remind us that in the 1600s uh, a handful of nutmegs could have bought you a house. Something um, that, small as it is, belies a kind of wide, wider history and becomes almost like a stand-in for a much longer and wider and more planetary history of colonialism, capitalism, and environmental destruction. So I was wondering if you could begin um, by describing briefly the historical events uh, that involved the Nutmeg, the Banda Islands, the Bandanese, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch East India Company, uh, and that prompted you to begin writing this book? Well, <clears throat> the Banda Islands are today completely forgotten. You know, they're, uh, they're at the other end of the world. Nobody ever visits them. Uh, but uh, the Banda Islands, uh, you know, were for, uh, for many centuries, uh, millennia really, uh, they were one of the most important trading hubs of the world. And the reason for that is that they had this incredible gift of the earth. Uh, which was the nutmeg tree. Uh, the nutmeg tree produces both nutmeg and mace, and the Banda Islands were the center of the world's nutmeg trade. So, in, in effect, I mean, you know, these islands had, a, had played a major role uh, in inspiring the, uh, the, the great uh, so-called voyages of discovery. Yeah, and uh, very soon after Vasco da Gama found his way into the Indian Ocean, uh, Europeans were making their way to the Banda Islands in order uh, to impose uh, a monopoly on, on nutmegs. So for about 100 years, they tried. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't possible. I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the islanders uh, weren't going to have their, uh, their great treasure uh, essentially taken away from them. 
1621, the Dutch East India Company, under the leadership of uh, the then Governor General, Jan Peterson Kuhn, uh, actually led uh, this attack uh, on the Banda Islands where, where they essentially completely eliminated uh, the native population. Uh, they, they murdered thousands, they drove thousands. Uh, um, you know, the Banda Islands are very small. The population was just 15,000 people. So they were very easily kind of overcome. But they murdered thousands. They drove many thousands into the mountains. A few hundred managed to flee. Uh, many, many were enslaved and sent off to other islands. Uh, so, you know, I, for me, this story is really uh, a sort of telling aside, you know, into uh, telling glimpse into modernity and the structures that created modernity. Uh, because here we have this incredible gift of the earth, a, a great blessing, if you like, that made the people of the Banda Islands prosperous for, uh, for centuries. And then it ultimately leads to their, uh, to their elimination. It becomes uh, an incredible curse, a tragedy. And in fact, uh, it's, a, it's an early example of the resource curse. Uh, you know, and the resource curse has now become a global. In effect, what we are seeing uh, in terms of the planetary crisis today is the globalization of the resource curse. Uh, you know, extractivism carried to its greatest possible limits where everything is sucked out, everything is consumed. And everywhere this kind of extractivism goes, it leaves behind a trail of utter destruction. Uh, you think of the sorts of plantation economies. Uh, you think of, um, of what rubber uh, did to the indigenous peoples of Brazil uh, or uh, the Congo, for that matter. So, you know, we are slowly but surely seeing, as it were, the globalization of a pattern of economy, which has really laid waste to the world. Uh, so a lot of the times when plants figure in histories and analyses of empire and colonization, they do figure as kind of um, passive uh, subjects in the sense of, or objects rather. Um, but you, there's a kind of turn in the nutmeg curse in which the nutmeg, you sort of really press on the point or lean into the point that the nutmeg has a kind of more than human agency in this whole story. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, what prompted that sort of shift? Well, in the broadest possible sense, you know, my, what my book is about uh, is about trying to discover uh, the voices of non-humans. You know, the non-humans, uh, non-human voices played such a large part uh, in human art, uh, you know, going back, uh, you know, to the very beginnings of human art. Human art uh, begins with, you know, the prehistoric depictions of animals, uh, you know, so uh, those were always a very powerful presence uh, in art, in literature. But what we see is that at beginning at about roughly the same period <clears throat> uh, as the destruction of the Banda Islands, that is the 17th century, uh, we see a, a steady process uh, whereby the non-human voice comes to be eliminated uh, from art, literature, and so on. So. <clears throat> My book, in my book, I'm really trying to, if you like, uh, 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 regain a sense of uh, non-human agency. Uh, I'm trying to find a voice for the non-human, if you like. And it is, it, it's just a simple fact that, in fact, so much of human life has actually been formed by, uh, by plants. You know, I mean, plants are, in a sense, these enormous hyper objects, if you like. I mean, just take tea, for example. I mean, tea, uh, it applies to a bush. It applies to something that, uh, you know, it applies to the dried leaves. Uh, it applies to so many kinds of objects that are tied together by the concept of tea. And tea was uh, really one of the great movers of history in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, so, uh, you know, just like the nutmeg was in the 16th and uh, 17th centuries, tea became uh, essentially one of the drivers of the world economy. And Tea essentially also unlocked uh, really the power of the opium poppy because the British, in order to pay for their tea, which they were getting from China, uh, started flooding China with opium. Uh, so, you know, it's these strange ways in which we see these uh, botanical entities, if you like, the ways in which they have really inserted themselves 
uh, into human life. And the best example of that is fossil fuels, because uh, fossil fuels are, after all, just fossilized botanical forests. <laughs> you know, they're just fossilized forests. And uh, if we look around us uh, ourselves now, we are completely in the grip of fossil fuels. You know, we like to think that fossil fuels are, are under our control, if you like, or that they're just tools. But in fact, they're not. I mean, they control us at this point. So uh, just a little bit more about this um, sort of, I suppose, project uh, around the uh, what you refer to in the book as muting the more than human. Um, in the Great Derangement, you um, you make the point that oftentimes we speak about climate breakdown as an effect of capitalism. Uh, and you sort of remind your readers that imperialism plays an enormous part in this. And I feel like um, there's there's then a kind of follow on and incredibly acute story that you weave throughout the Nut Nutmeg's Curse, where you do trace this very precise kind of line between settler colonialism specifically and environmental breakdown. And of course, you start in the Banda Islands, but you end up in the Americas with the genocide of indigenous people and the role that non-human agents played in that as well. Um, so you speak about outright killing, but also the destruction of livelihoods and landscapes. So keystone animals in forests, um, smallpox, and then of course, uh, terraforming through renaming. So all these different ways in which settler colonialism articulates itself. You use the term omnicide um, and speak about this, uh, the, the deniability which uh, the, the kind of weaponization and deployment of non-human agency kind of brings. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about this, like omnicide and this uh, deniability in relation to settler colonial practices and the role that settler colonial, settler colonial practices, of course, uh, play, um, as you make the point very powerfully in your book, in environmental breakdown. Well, <clears throat> you know, I think in the most general sense, our violence towards the earth springs from and is modeled on our violence towards other human beings. You know, and that's, uh, that's the essential thing that we see arising in this period in the 17th century. And I think really the 17th century is uh, absolutely the key to understanding uh, what we have around us today. Because it was in the 17th century, really, that you have on the one hand, uh, the enslavement of uh, Africans on a mass scale, and on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mass killings of, uh, uh, of uh, the native peoples of the Americas, who were also enslaved um, uh, often on a mass scale. But, you know, I think we forget sometimes the unprecedented nature of, these, uh, um, of this kind of violence. I mean, of course, human, uh, humans are a violent species. We've often been at war with each other and so on. But the nature of the violence that is unleashed with the European conquest of the Americas is something new under the sun. Uh, you know, I mean, never before have humans actually succeeded in wiping out uh, 70 to 90 percent of native populations. You know, and of course, that in itself is also preceded by similar forms of uh, uh, colonization in the Canary Islands, pioneered by the Portuguese and the Spanish, where again, they eliminated native peoples on a massive scale. And I think... <clears throat> You know, it's in this period, uh, really, that uh, European philosophers of the Enlightenment, Descartes and so on, uh, start making this argument that the earth is uh, inert, that it's essentially dead. And the only, the only beings who are sentient, the only beings who, who uh, can uh, make history, if you like, or who have historical agency, uh, are humans. But they didn't mean all humans, uh, you know. Uh, they meant is essentially they meant elite European men, uh, because uh, you know the same violence that they were unleashing against uh, um, um, against na uh, native peoples everywhere, they were also unleashing uh, against uh, European women and European peasants. You know these mass exterminations of uh, so-called witches and so on also occurs in the same period. And again, strangely, uh, those campaigns again are led by elite European men. So it's in this period, I think, that we see this state of mind coming into being, where we think that the earth is inert, that it has no agential properties, uh, it has no soul, no mind, nothing. Uh, it's just dead, and only we are alive. 
And, uh, you know, I think this is one of the great revelations that comes to us through climate change, you know, through these last 30 years. You know, suddenly we see that it's the earth itself inserting itself uh, into our into our thinking, into our art, into our literature. Because we see now that the earth is not inert, you know, that the earth is perfectly capable of striking back. You know, the metaphor that you might use is that, uh, you know, if you have a, a sitting elephant, a human being can go up to it and prod the elephant. And, you know, the elephant will take a little while to get out. You know, but when it comes after you, it's going to come after you very, very fast. And that's exactly what we see happening around us now. So just about this kind of um, the project of separating a particular human, European white male human, from quote unquote nature, everything else, and then muting the everything else. You describe it very, uh, very sort of clearly as a cultural project that bolsters the, let's say, military and uh, colonial project and the project of environmental breakdown. It's interesting because in the great derangement, you sort of you you make this call, this prompt towards storytellers, culture makers to kind of find words to speak of climate uh, change and, and, and environmental breakdown. And in the nutmegs curse, you say, well, this kind of cultural, the reason for this urgency is that this cultural practice has to, it, the cultural practice of, violent, uh, of violence and of colonialism and of the muting of the earth needs to be reversed. So um, I kind of read the nutmegs curse as this kind of almost instruction manual for how to think through a kind of cultural project that uh, that that begins to repair this other curse, like this this incredibly sort of hegemonic curse. Um, I wanted to ask you about this a little bit more in terms of, uh, I suppose, strategy, but also poetic strategy. It's, it feels like in today's uh, political and I suppose cultural mobilization, you have very strong kind of uh, movements on the environmental side and on the social justice side, and that there is a kind of there's a project of knitting together some forms of solidarity between those two. And I've often felt, and that's why your book felt like such a revelation, I've often felt that more than human paradigm is kind of one of those entry points. And so I wanted to ask you, um, what kinds of habits of minds or, connect, or concepts of time or writing styles or cultural kind of forms and movements can really help bring those two things together, planet, history, justice, deep time, uh, the more than human, and I suppose us in crisis now. You know, I'm, I hesitate to sort of lay down a blueprint because uh, I think, you know, this is the greatest challenge that uh, humans have ever confronted. And there are going to be millions of different responses, and there really should be. And we shouldn't, uh, certainly I don't want to be in a position of saying this is the right response and that is the right and wrong response or whatever. I think any kind of response is uh, in fact merited. But just to take the question of storytelling, you know, <clears throat> where can the non-human be given a voice? After all, it's not going to happen in the sciences. We know that. It's not going to happen in uh, economics, for example, you know, or in any of these social sciences. It's just not going to happen. So where can it happen? It can only happen in literature. Uh, you know, it can only happen in storytelling. It can only happen through art. And uh, that's how it, it always was in the past. You know, I mean, before this period, uh, starting in the 17th century, it was through stories that people interacted uh, with their environments, with their with the worlds around them, you know, increasingly there's a recognition that indigenous peoples' of, uh, practices, of their ways of living, uh, were in some sense profoundly uh, ecological, if you like, or profoundly uh, balanced if, uh, with uh, uh, with their environments. Now, uh, so today there's actually a sort of whole sort of social ecology movement where. Uh, people treat uh, uh, indigenous knowledge as something called traditional environmental knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge and try to, as it were, again, extract it and appropriate it and use it 
uh, for uh, you know new ecological practices, if you like. What they forget is that, in fact, for indigenous peoples, uh, the whole world was a story. You know, what underlay their practices was exactly practices of storytelling, uh, practices of cognition, practices of uh, just learning to uh, to recognize the land that you're in by telling stories about uh, about it. And I think we forget this at our peril. You know, we forget uh, the intricately uh, the intricately enmeshed nature of storytelling and the earth. And this is, of course, one of the really sad things that's actually happened, uh, especially within late modernity. I mean, you know, even in the 19th century, even in the mid 20th century, I would say. A storytelling was at the heart of cultural practice. Uh, today, uh, novels, fiction, uh, you know, they've, they've retreated to the margins uh, of our cultures. You know, I mean, and, you know, it makes, it's one of the things that makes one feel really, really hopeless because in fact, uh, I mean, I think there lies uh, the resource that we must use if we are to try and create a new way of relating uh, to everything around us. The story of art is quite different, actually, <clears throat> because art, I think, uh, certainly we know, uh, you know, it's a huge, uh, the art world uh, is a huge multi-billion dollar thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, art uh, has become in its own way incredibly exclusive, incredibly withdrawn uh, from the world we see around us. Uh, it's a world uh, really that's surrounded by gatekeepers and most of all surrounded by money. Uh, you know, so I do feel that the art world in particular really needs to try and find new ways of relating. And, uh, you know, there are many, many artists who are doing that, uh, who, are, who are trying very hard to find these new languages. Uh, there are artists who are allied with, let's say, Extinction Rebellion and all these movements. But they are not the artists who get the big shows, you know, in the big galleries. Uh, you know, and I think that's a very telling thing because it's not just a question of finding the artistic practices. It's also a question of creating a new kind of artistic ecosystem, of a new kind of literary ecosystem. An incredibly important call to action in the context of this conference, for which I'm very grateful. I wanted to mention how hopeful the uh, project of storing as a cultural storytelling project and this idea of like a politics of vitalism uh, that emerges at, towards the end of the uh, not mixed curse uh, truly feels when you're sort of uh, uh, looking for ways, <laughs> ways in, ways out, ways, ways through. So with that in mind, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing this time together uh, and hope to meet in person very soon. Thank you very much, Lucia. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So my name is Chris. Uh, I'm an architect and the founder of Proxy Address where we give stable address details to those who are going through the instability of homelessness. Now, I want to talk today about what proxy address is, but I also want to start by saying why it came about. So to do that, it's best to start to explain how, as an architect, most of my clients are organizations or individuals who can not only afford a building, but a bespoke building. So it's a bit unusual for an architect to end up working in homelessness. And to explain how that came about, I need to start by mentioning that I, started, I graduated architecture in 2009, which was right in the middle of the financial crash. Now in the UK, a third of architects were either unemployed or underemployed at that point. And yet at the same time, beneath our feet, there was a shift in how cities were working. The regime of austerity that came a year later led to funding cuts across the board. So we started to see libraries closing. We saw public land being sold off, parks shut down, homelessness increasing, libraries closed, massive changes to how our cities were working. 
And yet, as an architect, it wasn't really my duty to do anything about it, because as an architect, people don't come to you to ask you what should be built. They ask you to design what is going to be built. You're quite far downstream. And that can be problematic. Take, for example, this building. This is a, the Birmingham Library in uh, England, designed by Meccano, a Dutch architecture practice. It's a very good building, and they're very good architects. And it was loved by everybody. It cost about 189 million, so nearly a quarter of a billion dollars. And it was a, su a success. But within a year, because of funding cuts, both the opening hours and the number of staff were cut in half. So despite a very good job by the architects designing a good building, what the public actually got was half a building. Now, what I was really keen to do in my career was to try and find ways in which as an architect you can use your understanding of the city to try and more directly affect and benefit people who live in it without relying on these contingencies which we have very little control over. Now, fortunately, I got an opportunity to do just that. In 2017, I was made what's called a designer in residence at the Design Museum. And it gave me an opportunity to reflect on my role as an architect, but also it gave me the opportunity to explore the collections of the museum. And I remember a moment of clarity I had when I was looking at some chairs that are designed by architects, the classics, the Corbusier, the Mies, the Rietvelds, and I remember thinking, like, this is great that there are architects who are being multidisciplinary and moving out beyond the buildings. But then I was also hit by a notion that surely we, as a civilization, kind of have the chair problem wrapped up now, right? I mean, I've, I've never been short of a chair, and yet every day I'd walk into the museum and I'd walk past people who didn't have anywhere to live. They didn't have anywhere to live. That's a very architectural problem, and it's an urgent one, an oppressing one, but there didn't seem to be many architectural solutions other than the long-term solution of building for which architects can't raise the funds themselves. So to me, I was struck by this notion that as a, as, as a profession, as an architect myself, there is a duty to help, well, there's a duty to stand up and help the people who are being marginalized by the city rather than just designing more novel ways to sit down. So I decided to look into homelessness, and by doing so, I challenged a lot of my own assumptions and my own naivety. I'm fortunate enough that I've never been homeless. So I spent a year going around the country, speaking to hundreds of people who were homeless, speaking to frontline charity workers, food bank workers, but also to regulators, to financial people, to postal services, politicians and policy makers, anybody who would listen to me. And I found out a number of things that made me think about homelessness in a new way. And this is the first one. It's about the scale of the problem. In the United Kingdom, about one in 200 people face some form of homelessness. But when we think of homelessness, we tend to think of the person on the street. But actually, as you can see, rough sleeping is a small number. Actually, the vast majority of people who are homeless, they may have a roof over their head, but they're still homeless. And what underpins all of these situations is instability. Those who are rough sleeping have the complete inability to place down roots. Those who are in temporary accommodation are moved on with, with as little as 24 hours notice. And those who are sofa surfing, they end up having to move very, very frequently. And so my question is, what effect does this have? And the effect is very serious. So the average age of death of a rough sleeper in the United Kingdom is 44 years old. That's lower than any national life expectancy in the world. So why are people becoming homeless? Why are they facing this level of suffering? Well, most people might say, well, it's mental health or it's substance abuse. But actually, that's not the case. The number one cause of homelessness is the end of a private tendency. And in the vast majority of cases, mental health and substance abuse are caused by homelessness, not causes of it. Most people who become homeless are fully capable of recovery if given the right support at an early stage. So why aren't people recovering? Well, this is what I found. It's the role of an address in the basic foundations of a healthy, independent life. 
Because today, when you lose your home, you not only lose your shelter, but you lose your address. And it's a piece of information that was invented to describe a location, but today has become a de facto form of identification. So you lose your identity at the one time you need it most to access all the really key areas of services and support, everything from opening a bank account, being able to apply for jobs, healthcare, welfare, even being able to get married, all of these things require an address. And so what proxy address does is it allows people to borrow an address. But there's an important question here, really, which is what is an address? Because we tend to have a very intimate relationship with our own address. We consider it part of our personal information. And yet, if you buy a house, you don't buy the address. You don't own it. In fact, it's the most public information we have. You can walk down any street, look at the street sign, look at the number above the door, you have the address, and you have the location. It's simply when you attach it to an individual that it becomes sensitive information. So we source addresses from a number of different areas. We use long-term vacant properties, houses that have been empty for more than six months. We partner with real estate companies. We use in-construction houses, houses that have been assigned addresses, but people can't yet move in. And we also have personal donations. People could give $5 to a homeless person they see, but they could also give their address for systemic change to that individual at a cost of nothing. And with this, a proxy address user is able to access a whole variety of services. To use Post as an example, the best way to understand how the Post works is to use an example of Santa Claus. Now, every year in the United Kingdom, 800,000 children write a letter to Santa Claus. And there's a special address, Santa Claus at Reindeer Land XM45. And not to ruin anybody's day, but the letters don't go to Santa Claus. They go to a sorting office in Belfast in Northern Ireland, which, while a lot less romantic, is still a good reason to illustrate the point that that address could be anywhere. The address you put on an envelope is not its ultimate destination. It's a routing instruction. Anybody who's moved house and used a forwarding service knows how that works. And so we're able to do that with people who move frequently, who have no use for their mail, or people who move at very short notice. And the impacts are huge. Everything from, for instance, being able to apply for a job. If you have a care of address at a homeless shelter, if you ever try applying for a job with your address as care of homeless shelter, the stigma alone will stop you getting that job. With a proxy address, you're able to do that, but using a normal residential address. And then when it comes to financial services, getting a bank account is absolutely key. But that's one place where anti-fraud measures really come into their own. Now, we started Proxy Address Live during the pandemic, and we've already demonstrated compliance with anti-money laundering, know your customer, countering the funding of terrorism legislation overseen by the regulators themselves. And then when it comes to the government services, the, the public services itself, we're able to take governments, local and national, and save them money, to allow them to serve their duty to help prevent and relieve homelessness at a price that isn't going to interfere with their budgets. As I say, we've been going throughout the pandemic, and the impacts have been fantastic. We've had people who have been rough sleeping for years. In one case, in 18 days, after they got a proxy address, they had their own place. We had people who were rough sleeping um, for say, three years, I think. That person went on to get a job. Once they got their proxy address, they got a bank account, they got a national ID, they got a job, they got promoted, they got their own flat. They've since been promoted again. They're now a sales manager overseeing a region. We had a woman who was escaping a domestic violence relationship. Now, in those cases, it's very, very difficult because essentially they will have a bank account that is controlled by their abuser. And so if they leave, they are told by society you're not allowed to exist on your own without an address. We were able to help this woman get away and start a new life. The way she described proxy address was it's like a VPN for the real world. And she's now studying for her MBA. We've had people who are all homeless when they came to us go through things like being a chef, being a teacher, being an electrician. And every single one of those people, had they come to look for help, would have generally been told that they're a lost cause. But now they're all thriving. So we're expanding in the UK, and we hope 
beyond. So if you'd like to help or get involved, then you can contact us at the website. Um, but we're really keen to make sure that the city is working for the people who live in it. The architecture is not just the brick and mortar, the steel and glass. And if the last two years have shown us anything, it's that rapidly changing circumstances moving up against a legacy of built environment creates friction. Anybody who's done a Zoom call from a, you know, a spare bedroom knows how that feels. So as architects, we need to look to find a new way or additional ways to allow the city to work for us in such a way that it's adaptable to our needs. And hopefully, we can make it so losing your home doesn't have to mean losing hope. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eva Pfannes, and together with my partner in life and work, Sidwan Hartenberg, I'm the co-founder and director of Ooze. Our practice is based on the premise that we need to build agency for change and update several existing paradigms with new ones. We need to fundamentally re-understand and rewire natural dynamics. This requires a different attitude. For example, we would no longer steal or extract water, as it were, from Earth, but rather borrow it and give it back in the same state it was received. We use a tool of architecture, in fact, to make invisible processes visible and an integrated part of the urban realm, so they become relatable, they become tangible, discussable, and in this way you can build trust over time. Today I will tell you a little bit about our City of Thousand Tanks project in India. Chennai, a mega city in South India with a population of 10 million inhabitants, is expected to grow to 14 million by 2030. It faces three interconnected problems related to water. Water stress, so drought during hot summers, flood risk during the monsoons, and water pollution due to the sewage spilling untreated into the environment. Over the last several decades, these three interconnected problems have become worse. As a city grows rapidly and builds over traditional water tanks and into flood zones and natural areas that have regulated dynamic rainfall patterns in the past. The default answer to these three problems are traditional gray infrastructure solutions. Stormwater drains depriving the city as fast as possible of its precious resource water and desalination plants using large amounts of energy to win it back. By the way, Chennai is just an example of many, many cities. This happens mostly in the global south, but not only. Also, New York has, for instance, these combined um, systems in place. Chennai has always had these periods of intense rains and periods without rains. However, they did not always lead to floods and droughts in the past. Centuries ago, Chennai was a leading example of very smart water management, demonstrating how urban communities could live in close proximity to seasonal water hazards and still be in harmony with nature. Lakes, um, so-called eeries, and rivers and temple tanks embody Chennai's ecosystem identity. These water bodies acted as occasional reservoirs, absorbing water in the monsoon season and replenishing groundwater reserves for later use in the dry season. The tanks functioned like an upside-down pyramid, um, funneling water into the soil gradually over time. In more recent years, rapid urbanization, many more inhabitants with increased consumption, more industrial use, more pollution have made it difficult to maintain these traditional structures. City of Thousand Tanks offers a comprehensive and inclusive water balance strategy for Chennai to adapt to climate risks of droughts, floods, as well as prevent water pollution. The program intends to achieve water security by collecting rainwater, treating wastewater locally, and recharging both to the underground aquifer for later extraction. This will be achieved with plant-based, low-cost technologies, so-called nature-based solutions that put nature to work 
in the collection, treatment, and storage of water. All these um, solutions are ensuring no drop of water goes to waste, thus improving productivity in water sourcing, reducing consumer water costs, reducing economic losses caused by droughts and floods, reducing the urban heat island effect, for example, and increasing biodiversity and sequestering and re reducing carbon emissions. So what can we learn from this process so far? In fact, what we realized is that design is only 50% of the solution. The other 50% is governance and finance together. And we also know that people are very important in the process because the ultimate beneficiaries in this process and working with nature-based solutions is some uh, form of introducing a degrowth model into the urban environment because nature does the job for us. So how do we actually get where we need to be and how can we um, stay optimistic about the future? Now, one important kind of realization is that the big tech will not save us. It is not technical and that is actually what gives, gives me hope. It is tricky, it is messy and it is human. And it's a cognitive challenge, so we almost need a new uh, maybe age of enlightenment. It's also a practical and spatial challenge, like where do we find space in the surfaces that we already built in the city rather than expanding um, into natural areas that are much more useful if they kept like this. So there's a nice quote of Rebecca Solnit which says, um, hope is a discipline. It's an engagement with radical uncertainty. We don't know what is going to happen, but we may be able to participate in shaping what can happen. So by using architecture as this systemic tool and becoming active and doing things, that builds up hope because with each project we get closer to a solution um, that connects in a, in, a, in a network all the problems with the solutions we have to build up in the future. So the future is not tech, the future is social. Ecosystems have survived through many different um, extinction events and they have evolved by adapting, by cooperating with other species. We need to prove that many small scale solutions together, they can perform as good or better as the big tech solutions and they are much more enjoyable and more beautiful. Me llamo Hola Mizar y soy de Senegal y llegué aquí en 2006. Estamos uh, aquí en la antigua fábrica en el barrio de Sanse y donde tenemos uh, el taller de cosra de la marca Tomanta. Tomanta es una, una empresa que uh, somos uh, todos uh, africanos y, y algunos del país del sur. Y es una, una empresa que tiene dos tiendas ahora mismo, que tiene una, un taller aquí, un taller de costura donde eh, personas manteros que estaban en la calle pueden aprender aquí, pueden confeccionar y fabricar los ropas de tomate. En 2006 había muchísimo flujo migratorio, que muchísimos caicos que salieron desde Senegal en, y llegaron en Canarias. Eh, hubo un tiempo que muchísimos jóvenes eh, que se sentían estrangulados en su propio país eh, eh, decidieron coger los caicos, un viaje muy peligroso, un viaje arriesgado para llegar aquí mm, para cambiar su sueño. I was selling at the street. When I was selling at the street, the police used to look after us, follow us, run after us. We used to run and leave our belongings behind. Then I decided to join the Top Manta Association. They used to teach us English, uh, Castellano and Sewing. And they used to help us to pay our rents because things was not easy. Aquí es un país donde cuando llegan las personas uh, 
à qui nous tenons derecho de travailler parce qu'il y a une loi de extension créée qui impide à les personnes qui ont cours de la frontière de pouvoir travailler ou bien durant des mois et des mois nous avons travaillé dans la caille qui nous a reçu des mois et des mois de persécution et discrimination et d'espèce nous avons décidé de former ce syndicat qui lui a salué la marque de Manta es muy importante formar este sindicato porque um, hubo muchísimo tiempo que no teníamos voz, ¿no? que eh, hablábamos sobre nuestro nombre, ¿no? como los políticos, los partidos fascistas, los periodistas, hablaban sobre nosotros y no teníamos voz, eh, y que siempre hablaban mal de nosotros, que nos consideran como un colectivo uh, uh, violento, personas uh, que no, no tienen experiencia, experiencia ni sabiduría. But because of this association, we stopped selling at the street. We are here now. We are so united. We are working. We are having money. When we formed this syndicate, we were able to visibilize all the situation, the struggles, administrative and racism, social, institutional, that we are living in this community, that we are living in this country. For that, we consider that it is very important to form this syndicate and fight for our rights. La situation de un mantra es muy difícil porque el mantra es una persona que está enfrentando a muchísimas dificultades, que está frente a la persecución policial, la brutalidad policial. Es una persona que no tiene derecho para cobrar el paro, ni puede, ni tiene una protección laboral, ni puede ahorrar, ni tiene una cuenta bancaria. Estamos intentando regularizar a personas que tienen dificultad a encontrar un contrato de un año que pide la, las leyes uh, uh, de España. The project helped me a lot because I was at the street. Five days I'm sleeping outside because I don't have money to pay my rent. I don't have money to feed myself. They changed my life and my colleagues. The project stands for everybody here, everyone because they stand to fight for our peace. La marca Tomanta es una marca diferente de, de todos los demás porque no es una marca capitalista que lo han fundado cuatro personas para hacerse rico, pero es una marca um, social, es, es una marca resistente, es una marca, marca que, que viene para cambiar, ¿no? para cambiar la, la manera de trabajar, para restablecer los valores, valores, valores éticos. Uh, es una marca que utilizamos uh, para um, vehicular todos los mensajes, todas las dificultades. Uh, para, es una marca para luchar uh, contra el racismo, uh, contra la discriminación. Es una marca que permite a dar derecho a muchísimas personas que están en situación difícil, a muchísimas personas que el sistema le considera como personas ilegales y gracias con esta marca, gracias con la empresa Tom Manta, eh, podemos apoyar a personas a lograr esos papeles y poder viajar y trabajar como todo el mundo. Con Sara Ubieta hemos trabajado para sacar las bambas eh, Tom Manta, que es eh, la diseñadora de los zapatos. Hemos, eh, trabajando durante um, más de un año para sacar un, un zapato que eh, va a defender todos los valores éticos, que va a ser un zapato uh, de producción sostenible y que toda la trazabilidad uh, de este zapato lo sabemos uh, bien, de bien, uh, dónde viene cada cosa y al fin hemos logrado diseñar y sacar una bamba que está muy buena que que nos representa we are so grateful about the customers because of the customers the project is going up up and up so we we always thanks the customers because of the customers we are having money bueno creo que cuando compra una persona la marca Tom Manta que se siente que está haciendo una compra responsable está apoyando a una persona uh, que está excluido del sistema uh, laboral, una persona discriminada, una persona que está uh, enfrentado a muchísimas dificultades. Andadem es una palabra Wolof uh, de Senegal, uh, que significa caminar conjunto, 
eh, que significa trabajar desde la colectividad. Eh, bueno, eh, eh, si nosotros eh, podemos eh, fabricar una zapatilla a cero kilómetros hecho aquí eh, en Europa, entre los eh, talleres de Alicante y Portugal, creo que las grandes marcas que tienen más eh, herramientas, que tienen más poder, podrían hacerlo lo, aquí. Pero ellos prefieren eh, trabajar desde países del sur, desde nuestros eh, países, eh, explotando gente, esclavizando eh, a niños y niñas. Por eso es que nosotros digamos que no se trata solo de hacerlo, pero hay que hacerlo muy bien. We have to fight because we are all the same. We are all human beings. You are white, I'm black, I'm brown. We are all the same. We are not a criminal. I'm not a thief. The racist is not good. It's not good because we are not a criminal. We are just a human being. We have to stop the racist. It's dif the color is different, but we are all the same. Please welcome back to the stage, Beatrice Galilee. For session one, uh, thank you so much to our incredible speakers who flew in from all over the world to be here and for those who gave their time to make the films. Um, we are back at 2.15 for session two, starting with Taudo Ando. Um, and I just want to thank everyone involved with The World Around, with the Guggenheim, with Het New Institute, our producers, our board, our sponsors, Meta Open Arts and Omura. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you at 2.15 for Tadoando and many, many, many more. Okay, have a good break. Thank you.